Tonight, we give the floor to the writers as we celebrate the Catherine Min Fellowship for Asian American Writers. I met Catherine at McDowell during one of her first residencies in the late 90s and was instantly drawn to her kind and radiant personality. We shared a love of McDowell and New Hampshire. Years later, I invited her to participate on the literature panel. She was an enthusiastic reader and an advocate for promising young writers. Her face would light up and she would become animated as she talked about the writing samples. I am thrilled that her legacy and advocacy of writers will continue through this fellowship. As a quick side note, we will be recording the event tonight. The first portion of the program will be available to the public on our website at mcdowell.org, while the memorial portion will be recorded for Catherine's family. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Marie Myung Oak Yuli, our host for the evening. Marie is the author of the forthcoming novel, The Evening Hero, and several young adult novels, including Finding My Voice, newly republished for the third time. Her stories and essays have been published in The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Paris Review, Slate, Joyland, Guernica, and more. She is a founder and former board president of the Asian American Writers Workshop, and she teaches fiction at Columbia University where she is writer in residence. She was a McDowell Fellow in 2004. Welcome, Marie. Thank you, Courtney, for that lovely introduction. So good evening. I'm honored to welcome you tonight to On Being a Sprinter, the inaugural Catherine Min Fellowship celebration. Tonight, we celebrate the life and legacy of Catherine Min, a writer, educator, and McDowell Fellow, and the permanent endowment of the Catherine Min Fellowship, which fully funds an annual residency for an Asian American writer at McDowell in perpetuity. With me here tonight are Kayla Min Andrews, Victoria Chang, and Kathy Park Hong. We'll share some readings with the audience for about an hour. Afterwards, we will invite family and friends of Catherine to come forward to share in remembrance. So Catherine Min spent eight residencies at McDowell between 1995 and 2013. Along with the uninterrupted time to write, Catherine loved the picnic basket lunches, the friendly pool games, the late night dance parties, and the opportunity to meet and share and work with other artists. She cherished the lifelong friendship she made at McDowell and was in turn a beloved member of our community of fellows, staff, and supporters. Catherine was beloved to me too. Kindred spirits, best friends, seems like a corny way to describe our friendship. But I remember in the early aughts coming upon her short story, Oriental Sex Kittens for a Nuclear Free Zone in a literary journal and laughing so much at the wit and joy and sneaky intelligence in the writing that I immediately wrote to her to let her know I was a fan and also that I was using her story in a creative writing class I was teaching. It turned out she was using one of mine. I guess not that surprising as how many Korean American writers were there at the time. We corresponded vigorously for years and then were devastated that our McDowell residencies in 2004 missed overlapping by one week. So if anyone in the audience now is at McDowell with me then, they can attest that this be being before social media, that starstruck, I kept bugging the people who actually met her to tell me what she was like. She sounded to me like a gorgeous otherworldly creature who wore giant earrings and beautiful high-heeled boots in the middle of January in the middle of the snowy woods of McDowell. We soon mutually traveled to New York where we finally met. And even though she lived in North Carolina and I lived in Rhode Island at the time, McDowell was one of the ways we got to meet subsequently. When she was on one of its committees that met in New York, I would take the train down and spend a few days with her. And I was always grateful for McDowell for making this possible. This work was important to her because McDowell was important to her. And she hoped to create opportunities so that others could come up to the woods of Peterborough and also be similarly transformed. Catherine was so good at making basically anywhere she was brighter and livelier for those around her. And for herself, McDowell was indeed her happy place. 
After Catherine's passing in 2019, her family and friends set out to permanently endow a fellowship in her name at McDowell. Catherine was so excited about the idea of creating a fellowship that would allow Asian American writers to share in the McDowell experience that so deeply enriched her own life. This fellowship will allow McDowell to continue to elevate Asian American voices in all forms of writing and to strengthen McDowell's commitment to serving the Asian American writing community. So thank you all for joining us here tonight to celebrate Catherine's fellowship, artistry, inspiration, and life. Now I'd like to introduce our first reader for the evening. Kayla Min Andrews is Catherine Min's daughter. She writes personal essays and short stories. She is a proud member of the Podunk Writers Alliance. Her work has appeared in the literary magazines Halfway Down the Stairs in Asymptote. She can be found walking and biking around her adopted city of New Orleans. She will read two pieces by Catherine, followed by a wonderful piece of her own. So Kayla, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Marie. And I wanna say a huge thank you to McDowell, especially Jenny, Gina, and Brett. Thank you so much for your hard work and for making this happen. I'm gonna read three pieces for you today. Um, the first one is the longest one, and it's fiction. And then I'll read two much shorter nonfiction pieces. So the first piece is from her novel, The Fetishist. Um, she did have a complete draft of this novel, but it was unfinished um, at the time of her death. Um, this passage that I'm gonna read, she wrote in 2013, um, before she was diagnosed with cancer. The Fetishist is a novel with many characters and plot lines and crazy events. This one focuses on Alma. She is a classical cellist, very accomplished um, in the world of classical music. She's in her 50s now and she's in a coma due to an illness. So in this passage, we see what she's thinking about while in the coma. And the name of this excerpt is The March of the Rice Kings. Alma was not normally a list maker, a stock taker, an adder upper, but on the smooth black wall of her coma slowed mind had begun a strange tally. Johnny Appleby had been the first, tall with listless blonde hair and a fuzz of mustache, senior to her freshman, clarinet to her cello. In a leather vest with fedora and suspenders, he fancied himself a dandy and was, or what passed for one in regional youth orchestra. Backstage during a rehearsal of Bizet's Carmen Suite Number no. One, he had leaned into her, his clarinetist's embouchure grazing her ear, tickling the tiny hairs of its inner channel. Oriental girls are so sexy, he had whispered, then walked away, never to utter another word to her again. But the damage had been done. Johnny Appleby had sown his seed, impregnated her with his five word pronouncement. Oriental girls are so sexy. Blush of pleasure at the implication. Soon Ja Lee, flat chested, twig legged, scale practicing daughter of greengrocers, was oriental, like a rug, and therefore she was sexy. Alma, who was taking a course in logic at the local community college, another stereotype affirmed, the genius Asian student, knew this syllogism to be improbable. But even if it were true, what solace was there in being part of a throng, a teeming corridor of black haired button nosed girls with sallow skin and narrow hips? If they were all sexy, then they were all the same. And if they were all the same, then in what sense was she, Alma Sunja Lee, ninth grade cello prodigy, a distinct and disparate entity worthy of individual attention? And yet, the possibility had emerged from nowhere, from the hot clarinetist's breath of a boy she had barely noticed before, the possibility of sexy. And who cared really where it had come from? In ninth grade, Johnny Appleby was a messenger from that other as yet unknown life, a bearer of tidings from a future self. 
Oriental girls are so sexy, he had whispered to her in conspiratorial aside, casually, but with a whiff of portent that kept on whispering, kept on conspiring, until it became a kind of scaffold, spring platform to a glamorous and exciting new life. Here, from within her coma, Alma ruefully congratulates herself from the other side of that life, reaches back with tenderness and knowing mockery to chuck her younger self under the chin. She could offer advice, beware what you wish for, sister, or solace, you'll have fun. But in the end, all she can do is nod her head to acknowledge the moment retrospectively recognized and reinforced by repetition when the promise of allure had first been offered at the cost of self erasure and the twisted roots of racism had become so deeply embedded in desire that she could not dig them out, could not, in truth, distinguish them from the healthy roots. And so Alma from her coma finds herself surveying all the Asian fetishists she has known over the years. Rice kings, they were called. Asia files, victims of that incurable disease known as yellow fever. Every Asian woman knew the generic type, but Alma, world traveler and classical music diva, responsible for more malarial outbreaks than any damn mosquito, had broken it down further into three subcategories. Number one, the cultural ambassador recognized by his pedantic tendency and messianic glint. Accessories may include Chinese character tattoo, usually love, honor, courage, or something meaningless copied incorrectly from off a fortune cookie, Korean War bomber jacket, Buddha beads, or in the home, joss sticks and an electric rice cooker. Writing of haiku, optional. One cultural ambassador, a big money symphony donor, had been eager to show Alma his chopstick collection. Another, the bonsai trees he'd brought back from Japan. I deeply respect and honor your people and your culture. Ni hao. I could tell you were Thai right away. Yeah, I can always tell. Oh, you're Korean? That was my next guess. I took a course in Mandarin Chinese. I have a black belt in karate. I love Vietnamese food. Did you know that the Chinese invented gunpowder? I think Kurosawa is the Asian Spielberg. I do yoga. I'm thinking of becoming a Buddhist. Did you know such pretty hair? Your skin is so smooth. Can I touch it? Can I kiss you? In Alma's opinion, there was something endearing about the cultural ambassador. In his eagerness to prove himself a connoisseur of all things Asian, Alma read a paucity of confidence, saw the great white void against which was projected this false authority. It was a ransacked specialness he was after, distinction by proximity, and the longing for it moved Alma, even as it annoyed her. A far different animal was the second type, which Alma had dubbed the carnal colonialist. Worldly, where the cultural ambassador was Jejun, charismatic rather than boorish, insinuating as a serpent instead of bumbling like a bear, he was, in Alma's experience, altogether more sinister. Once at a party, a somewhat famous violinist had approached Alma. She had been wearing a red satin evening gown with a dramatically plunging back, and he laid a chilly hand on her bare flesh, breathing scotch into her neck, and asked if she might please join him in the men's room in five minutes. You're ravishing, he had exclaimed. I just can't control myself. When Alma turned him down, laughing really because it was so absurd, the somewhat famous violinist had shrugged. Another time then, he had said, his eye already roving to Celine Kawanishi, the second violist. The carnal, colonia, the carnal colonialist lived in a fantasy world of triple X-rated movies, 
oriental sex kittens, wild Chinese babysitters, Hong Kong, King Dong. They collected Asian erotic art, woodblock prints of the floating world, obscene netsuke of copulating couples, were aficionados of pink film, Japanese softcore porn. In her younger days, Alma had succumbed to a few men of this type. Hell, she had married one. And she knew from experience that they wore kimonos instead of robes, favored doggy style, and kept silk bondage gear and ornate sexual apparatus in the bedroom. Speak dirty to me in Korean, baby. Oh yeah, hanguk saram chayo. The third type was the rational revolutionary. Unlike other rice kings who are almost exclusively white, rational revolutionaries were usually black or Hispanic or either kind of Indian and their modes of seduction were politically formulated. Alma had encountered many rational revolutionaries on tour in South America, parts of Africa and the Caribbean. They were trim, dark men with narrow mustaches or puffed out with pomaded hair in crisp guayabera with khaki pants or natty three-piece suits encountered on terraces overlooking sunset on water or at buffet tables in hotel ballrooms. My dear, you have not lived until you've had an Egyptian, Ghanaian, Senegalese, Honduran, Dominican lover, hands a certain distance apart as though denoting the proverbial fish that got away. You don't, eyes suddenly piercing with indictment, have anything against men of my skin color, do you? A cultural attache with the Nigerian embassy had grown angry with Alma when she declined the offer of his company for the night. Do you know what you are, Miss Lee? He had told her. I regret to say this, but you are what we call a banana yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Yes, I am certain this must be the case. Rubbing their palms together, smiling with only their mouths, rational revolutionaries made discussing politics earnest foreplay. Sleep with me and together we will strike a blow against the evils of American cultural and economic hegemony. This was their rousing pickup line. Spurring their advances then was not a mere matter of personal rejection, but a deliberate turning away from all that was good and a terrible repudiation of the struggle of oppressed dark people everywhere. Like an heiress with a fortune then, Alma had learned to be suspicious of all suitors, lest they should desire her solely for her luscious yellowness. Whether for cultural status, sexual conquest, or racial solidarity, she would be no one's tiger lily, china doll, geisha girl, baby son, Miss Saigon, Susie Wong, me love you long time, goddamn bad, madame butterfly. Except, except, and here was the thing that even from the depths of coma, Alma finds hard to face. From Christophe, Paolo, Ben and Daniel, echoing all the way back to Johnny Appleby. There was a part of her that believed she was, in fact, all these things, that this was all she had to offer. All right, um, now I'm gonna read one of her personal essays. I'm so excited to read this for you tonight because my mom's career was as a fiction writer and unexpectedly when she got diagnosed with cancer, she said that she had lost interest in fiction and wanted to, and she, she turned to nonfiction, to personal essays. Um, and she told me once in hospice that she believed her personal essays were her best work, which is staggering when you consider how good her fiction is. So this is one of my favorites. It was written in 2018, about a year before she died. On being a sprinter. Watching Usain Bolt in the 100 meter dash at the 2016 Rio Olympics got me thinking. I've always been fond of sorting the world into my own odd Aristotelian categories. 
for example, Iliad people versus Odyssey people? Do you see life as a battle or as a journey? Novelist or short story writer? Is your temperament better suited for the rhythms of real life or for the stop time of the transcendent moment? Heart versus head artists. Is your work a sincere attempt to communicate something about the human condition? Or is it an in-joke, a you get it or you don't and fuck you if you don't provocation? Of course, the categories are binary and clearly rigged according to my own tastes and proclivities. But I think they can illuminate something interesting about character, the way we define and display ourselves. I realized in the 9.80 seconds that it took Usain Bolt to win the gold medal in Brazil that I have always been a sprinter. Metaphorically, of course, it would take me 9.80 minutes probably to go 100 meters. Marathon runners need to marshal their energies, to regulate, to modify, and to think ahead. There's no time for that in a sprint beyond a split second, maybe. Otherwise, it's just full out, flat out, the end. Being a sprinter, to me, means that you prefer the kinds of projects that require a burst of inspiration, a lightning zap of energy, over the ones that demand a more prolonged and patient course. It means processing things quickly, sometimes hastily, and coming to fast judgments. I think of sprinters as hating small talk, as being easy with their intimacies and intense in their likes and dislikes. They are Blake's tigers of wrath and not his horses of instruction. As a writer, a sprinter is a poet or a short story writer, a control freak who likes to see the shape of something all at once, to contain it in two hands and mold it into as perfect a configuration as they can. I would be a poet if I weren't stupid about meter and line breaks. I had to trick myself into writing a novel by accumulating three to four page vignettes, an idea I stole from Evan S. Connell and his great novel, Mrs. Bridge. Just kept writing until I had a book length manuscript, then spent a long time rearranging them in coherent sequence. I suspect one of the reasons I got bogged down with the fetishist is that I was pushing myself to write a more conventional novel with long chapters, following many characters across long periods of time. For the truth is that I have always been impatient with real life, with its tedium and its pettiness it's flossing and flushing, it's what's for dinner and how you doing. Insofar as novels successfully mimic the rhythm of the day-to-day, -day, I quote Virginia Woolf. Art is not a copy of the real world. One of the damn things is enough. It is why I was not so good at marriage and better at having short affairs. You got the passion and the yearning, the magic and the mystery the heightened emotion and the febrile lovemaking without garbage, dishes, or casual flatulence. Perfection and transcendence insofar as these things are achievable, and of course they are by their very natures not, is what I craved. The sublime in all its swirling, cloud-lit, overwrought, mountaintop, gothic ruination, with all its silliness and pretension, its awesomeness and sentimentality, I wanted more of that, please. And never mind its ridiculous adolescent jerk off tendencies. I never really outgrew it. Being a sprinter means that you are not in it for the long haul. What you lack in stamina, you make up for in speed. Short, but intense, fast, but not far. It occurs to me and I know this will sound strange, that having stage four cancer might suit me temperamentally. Knowing my time frame is limited has given me the discipline and concentration to write these short personal essays. I am recording videos of myself reading children's books out loud to my future grandkids, coming soon, I hope. 
Frog and Toad are friends, the phantom toll booth, Owl Moon. I know cancer has made me a happier, more focused person, more attentive to my loved ones, more present in the small moments, less prone to grumpiness, more to appreciation. The habit of virtue is new to me and it's easier because I don't have to keep it up too long. And the last piece that I'll share with you tonight, um, it's something that I wrote for mom and about mom. So it's a flash, flash nonfiction. So this one's for you, Moot. Old Kleenex. Fluffy handfuls of pilling powdery Kleenex, unused, tattered, slightly gray worn smooth like sea glass from the friction against itself, curled inward in rounded sullen clumps. Handfuls of old Kleenex are in the pockets of all her clothes, now my clothes, her boot cut Levi's with a stray pen mark on the left thigh, her black down vest like a puffy suit of armor, the shiny leather pants I know I'll never wear the stylish wool smock of a dress I wear on my 33rd birthday, the first one without her. I throw them out unceremoniously as I find them. It's only been a few weeks and who would attach significance to old Kleenex? Some of her sundresses have pockets and I'm surprised when my hands find old Kleenex there, ghostly remnants now that it's been six months. I don't throw them out. When I wear the dresses, there is a slight bulge in my silhouette from the Kleenex in the pockets. But maybe it's something only I notice because only I know it's there. She always threw them away after a single use extravagantly. I consider them still good if there is any unused corner. I leave partly used ones on the bedside table, saving them for later. A friend once put it this way, your mom is a flapper from the roaring 20s and you're a depression baby. It's true. She blew through lovers, money, life itself. She didn't save anything for later. Use them up, she told me once, apropos of boyfriends, when I was 15 and all elbows and adoration, gazing at her and saying nothing. The chemo gave her a runny nose, one of its least alarming side effects. Mom put the Kleenex in her pockets, but if a box was nearby, she'd take from there and buy a new box when that one was through. So the pocket Kleenex stayed where they were, crumpled, superfluous, abandoned. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Kayla. It was really moving. Not only hearing your mother's work, but also just to see how you are growing into your own as a writer. And it was really it's so wonderful hearing them both together. And really to hear her voice again. Um, after Catherine received her diagnosis, I was also amazed and shocked when she called me to declare that even with that full draft of a novel that she I've been writing that she's done writing fiction and would now only write essays. And I, I really feel that she has in so many ways like left us her heart in these essays because I keep them and I reread them. Her presence is instantly felt um, as it is with the piece that you wrote as well. I feel these short sprints indeed give the reader a zap of energy with every reading. And it's a kind of dynamism that brings me back to another essayist, Mujanya, who might have easily said about Catherine's work as he did about his own, that it tries, it essays, not so much to depict being, um, but to depict passage. So our next reader is Victoria Chang. And Victoria was in residence at McDowell in 2019 
and was the inaugural recipient of the Catherine Min Fellowship. Her poetry books include Barbie Chang, The Boss, Salvina Molesta, Circle, and Obit, which was a 2020 National Book Critics Circle Award finalist and on the long list for the National Book Award. Her children's picture book is Mommy, illustrated by Maria Frazee, Marla Frazee, excuse me, was named a New York Times notable book. Her middle grade novel, Love, Love, was published last June by Sterling Publishing. She lives in Los Angeles and is the program chair of Antioch's low residency MFA program. So Victoria, if you're ready, please take it away. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? I had to pop off because my internet was, am I, you can hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, wow, that was really wonderful, Kayla. Um, I'm very moved and very honored to be the inaugural Catherine Min Fellow at McDowell. I, I feel sad that I never got to meet your mom, but I feel like I know her after you read your piece. So thank you so much. Um, she sounds really cool. <laughs> Um, thank you, Colin, Kayla, again, McDowell, Marie. It's such a pleasure to be here with Kathy Park Hong and all of you um, who are here today to celebrate Catherine's life. I'm going to read uh, just some poems from my um, most recent book. And uh, there's not much to know except that uh, my mother passed away in, in 2015 of, of pulmonary fibrosis. So um her that's when your lungs sort of harden and you you gradually suffocate to death so it's not uh not a fun disease and then my my dad who appears in these poems sometimes he had a stroke maybe about 12 or 13 years ago and he lost his language and so they they appear in here off and on and these are all written in a shape of obituary so um things many things die this one's called Optimism. Optimism died on August 3rd, 2015, a slow death into a pavement. At what point does a raindrop accept its falling? The moment the cloud begins to buckle under it or the moment the ground pierces it and breaks its shape. In December, my mother had her helper prepare a Chinese hot pot feast. My mother said it would probably be her last Christmas. I laughed at her. She yelled at my father all night. I put a fish ball in my mouth. My optimism covered the whole ball as if the fish had never died, had never been gutted and rolled into a humiliating shape. To acknowledge death is to acknowledge that we must take another shape. This one's called My Mother's Teeth, and she had dentures, and so um, I think that's probably all you need to know. <laughs> My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease, once again on August 3rd, 2015. The fake teeth fit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter looking for meaning to attach to like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring. I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. This one is called music. Music died on August 7th, 2015. I made a video with old pictures and music for the funeral. I picked Hallelujah and Acapella because they weren't really singing, but actually crying. When my children came into the room, I pretended I was writing. Instead, I looked at my mother's old photos, the fabric patterns on all her shirts, 
the way she held her hands together at the front of her body. In each picture, the small brown purse that now sits under my desk. At the funeral, my brother-in-law kept turning the music down. When he wasn't looking, I turned the music up because I wanted these people to feel what I felt. When I wasn't looking, he turned it down again. At the end of the day, someone took the monitor and speakers away, but the music was still there. This was my first understanding of grief. Um, I wrote about 70 of these and I just sort of stopped. And then I started writing other poems and I, I started writing tankas and tafinas and all sorts of formal poems. And the tankas were the only ones that made it in here and they're 31 syllables and they come in little pairs. And so I'll just read one pair. I tell my children that hope is like a blue skirt. It can twirl and twirl, that men like to open it, take it apart, and wound it. I tell my children that sometimes I too can hope, that sometimes nothing moves but my love for someone and the light from the dead star. And those are really hard to write because you have to get the syllables exactly, exactly right. Um, this one is called The Clock, and I'll just read maybe, I'm looking at my clock, I'll read maybe um, a couple more of these obits and then maybe a, a pair of tankas and then, and then I'll be done. The clock died on June 24th, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types, the hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock its perfect circle and its superposition, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thought, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far our brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything, but when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish, and when they're gone, they're gone. And I wasn't going to read this one, but I'll read it because Kayla was reading about dresses, and I thought I'd read my poem about dresses. This one is called The Blue Dress. The blue dress died on August 6, 2015, along with the little blue flowers, all silent. Once the petals looked up, now small pieces of dust. I wonder whether they burned the dress or just the body. I wonder who lifted her up into the fire. I wonder if her hair brushed his cheek before it grew into a bonfire. I wonder what sound the body made as it burned. They dyed her hair for the funeral, too black. She looked like a comic character. I waited for the next comic panel to see the speech bubble and what she might say, but her words never came and we were left with the stillness of blown glass, the irreversibility of rain and millions of little blue flowers. Imagination is having to live in a dead person's future. Grief is wearing a dead person's dress forever. 
Yeah, maybe I'll just read one more. Um, and this one is, uh, I guess the only thing you need to know about this one is it refers to the Marjorie Stoneman shooting in Florida. And we're still here, right? America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is danced still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its feet. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket, the dead on image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Wow. And, and congratulations for being the first Catherine Min Fellow. And thank you so much for that. It was, it was really moving and it just catches the stutter steps that time becomes in grief. Um, and I was looking at your book again today and I was realizing I love on the book jacket for Obit that you say adamantly about not wanting to write elegies for your loved ones for fear of cliche, but that the word Obit caught you because the long O and the hard T and I think Catherine would have loved the humor and the subversion in that work um, and how it's indeed sad, but it's also filled with so much humor and even joy. And I think she really would have liked the snappiness and sprintiness of a bit um, much better than an elegy. I think I can say that. So next up, we have Kathy Park Hong. Kathy is the author of Minor Feelings. Um, an Asian American Reckoning, which was published last spring and is a 2020 National Book Critics Circle Award um, winner. And it was a finalist, now it's winner. <laughs> so, she is also the author of the poetry collections, Engine Empire, Dance Dance Revolution, which was chosen by um, Adrienne Rich for the Barnard Women's Poet Prize and translating Mo. She is the poetry editor of the New Republic and is a full professor at Rutgers Newark University. And Kathy and Catherine and I all um, at a different residency had a wonderful summer together in 2009 where we all became friends. So Kathy, if you're ready, um, please go ahead. <laughs> oh. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Victoria. That was an incredible uh, reading. I was almost near tears. And um, thank you, Kayla, for sharing your mother's work. She's so brilliant. It, and thank you for sharing your beautiful piece as well. I'm really happy to be here to share uh, um, this moment talking about Catherine. And as you see here, this is a little photo. I was at the other residency at Yaddo uh, with. Uh, um, Catherine, that's where I first met her. Um, so when I met Catherine at Yaddo, I think it was in 2009, what first struck me was her absolute openness, friendliness, and girlishness. Uh, Koreans were actually overrepresented that summer as, and Catherine adored that we were overrepresented. There was Marie, Dawn, Catherine, and me. Um, I really distinctly remember having our photos taken there in the grand yellow velvet love seat. Um, I remember how she was confided in me almost immediately, uh, talking about the insecurities of growing up Korean, the struggles of being a writer, her past marriage. 
she talked about her children with such deep affection. I was hoping, I hope that I too would have such a close relationship if I ever had children. I can still recall her leaning over to confide in me, her earrings dangling as we talked about her beautiful mothers and her own complicated relationships with beauty since we grew up in a culture where blonde white women, not Asian women, were beautiful. She was so vulnerable and wise and loyal. I was still too guarded at the time, not ready to reveal my own vulnerability at the time the way she was able to. I also recall hearing her read from her novel in progress called The Fetishist, and I remember being absolutely transfixed. She described it as Lolita, except Lolita was a young Asian woman. As she read the first chapter, I believe, I recall a, a detail about the man watching the girls unclacking her retainer. She told me about having to rewrite and rewrite it to get it perfectly right. Like her writing, Catherine was attentive, sensitive, brilliant, and tender. And I will always treasure my friendship with her forever. Um, and I'm just going to read a few pieces, a poem, and then just like an excerpt of a short prose piece. And I thought I would read, um, these, uh, they're like, um, it's about being a mother. I was thinking of Catherine and I was thinking about what a wonderful mother she must have been and what a close relationship she must have had. Uh, they're um, Kayla and her kids. And so I thought I would read um, um, my own, about my own experiences as a mom, Night Whispers. Shush into your infant's ear so she can sleep at this late blue hour when street lights pale. And there reflected you, stark, sodden with milk, committed to one life. Whereas before, you dreamed the lives of so many others. Outside, a row of planes blinking across the sky. And you want to be inside the white hush of a dimly wet lit cabin milk buds sunk into your ears, head lolling back on the sponged pillow, roaring out to Dubai or Berlin. But no, you are home among a system of white noises, fan, mechanical rabbit, tiny little machines to make her sleep, medication, days of vigilantly monitoring your own moods, recalling Mary Cassatt, how female painters were limited to painting what's around them, potted ivy, mother washing her child's feet, your life struck like a stage set, muted into grays, whites, rather than a pirate's treasure of liquid ruby, dormant world of soil and stars, your private thoughts scrambled from lack of sleep welcomes lovely little dawn. Your own mother wakes, dreamed, your newborn walked, and with one breath blew away all the furniture in the room like a little wind god. This is what is left. Um, and then I'm just gonna read a little prose piece, a prose piece that's sectioned off. Uh, it's about plants. Um, and it's the premises that how about how I know nothing about plants. <clears throat> Fiddlehead fern. My grandmother used to travel on a bus with her church friends to the San Bernardino mountains to harvest fiddlehead ferns. I went with her as a child a couple of times. The bus would drive to a rest area where travelers stopped to eat at Burger King. On a tawny hill there, dozens of elderly Korean women with towels over their heads would squat to forge for fiddleheads. After collecting a few bags worth, my grandmother would march into the rest stop bathroom to wash the bristly sticky bracken in the sink. 
I recall how in Congress she looked with that towel over her head like a peasant farmer from the old country amid the white Californians on their way to hit the ski slopes. I didn't know until much later that these plants were called fiddleheads, kosori, was what we called them, monk food, because they were supposed to quell sexual desire. My family ate them blanched and marinated for dinner. Princess tree. Princess trees are an invasive species that grows everywhere in Gowanus, our industrial gentrified neighborhood. They are known to flourish, especially in disturbed habitats like forests defoliated by gypsy moths and other places stripped of vegetation by global warming. They have wide floppy leaves that are so big you can wrap your hand in one to make a hand taco, big enough even to make a tourniquet. In spring, princess trees issue a foam of pale lavender flowers. But I confess that I never noticed their blossoms, would never have noticed these trees at all, even if even if it weren't if it weren't for my husband and daughter who shout, look, a princess tree, every time we came across one. My daughter likes the whimsical name. She also likes the story of how princess trees arrived in Gowanus, or at least as it's told by my father. The trees are native to China, and in the 1800s, the soft seed pods were used to cushion porcelain in crates that were then shipped across the Pacific to the U.S. As Dockman unloaded these crates from the Guanas barges, the seed pods would escape and fly everywhere, taking root in the starved soil of abandoned lots. Indeed, my daughter liked to identify them because the princess trees grows in unexpected places like the edges of parking lots, construction sites, and within the cracks of sidewalks. I also learned that the princess tree is so-called because a seedling used to be gifted to Chinese families when a daughter was born and was chopped down once she married. Now princess trees grow unimpeded along the embankments of the toxic Gowanus Canal. They grow in idle construction lots where development has been halted by COVID. They climb the walls of security fencing in crowd plots de designed for the native oak. This past spring, when Brooklyn was finally desert, was especially deserted, I was alarmed to see weeds sprouting from the sandbox of an empty locked playground. It reminded me of the famous photographs of Chechnya, in which the corroded interior of an abandoned school was swallowed by mountains of verdant overgrowth. It is a cliche nowadays for a writer to imagine the apocalypse, but it's too irresistible. I have visions of princess trees climbing walls, creeping into open windows, doorways, and air shafts until the whole city is one green twining chrysalis. Japanese you. Years ago, when I was troubled by my horticultural ignorance, but too lazy to do anything about it, I fantasized about owning a device that could tell me the name of each plant if I've simply pointed at it. Now, of course, there's an app for that. On walks with my daughter, I will occasionally pull up iNaturalist. I take a picture of a plant and the app tells me its name. The hedge that edges the condo near my apartment is a Japanese U. The flowers by the parking garage where people rent zip cars are meadow sage, though no meadow is in sight. And that U is not in Japan. The plant's provenances seem out of context. The names like starchy ornamental labels. I haven't yet swaddled these names with the memories needed to melt the name into the plant until it becomes the plant itself. My daughter, though, accepts the names more readily. On her way home from school one day, we came across berries in enchanting colors of icy blue and purple. The iNaturalist app identified them as porcelain berries. My daughter picked a cluster, wrapped them in a bindle of leaf, and took them home. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kathy, for the poem and the prose on the joys of natural world. 
And I have to admit, I actually read the whole piece that you did because it made me think of how your daughter sounds like she might be a poet next because um, she called those ginkgo berries because they smell when you step on them, gunko, <laughs> gunko <laughs> berries. <laughs> and I know there's another poet coming up. Um, and I'm so glad that you highlighted um, motherhood um, because I knew Catherine first just as an artist, um, but then over the years, I. I had the honor and fun of um, getting to know her two adult children, um, Clay and Kayla. And in fact, um, I even hung out with them without her. And in fact, when we were, um, Catherine and I were in AWP in Portland, um, Clay was there. Actually, I think it was Seattle and Clay wanted to hang out with us. And I just thought, who's it tell kids want to hang out with their parents? And I think that was just so, such a tribute to, um, what an attentive, engaged mother she was and is. And I think that is also just part of her art and also fed into her being such a great professor and how much her students loved her and she did so much mentoring and somehow managed to do her own work. So, um, but I also wanted to congratulate you. It's funny that um, the status of your of Minor Feelings has changed. I want to congratulate you that Minor Feelings freshly won the National Book Critics Circle Award for and for autobiography, because I feel like, especially in this time of upsurge of violence against Asian Americans, that your work is an autobiography for all of us, for all Korean Americans and Asian Americans. So thank you for that, Kathy. So. So all the work we've heard tonight has, has just been so, I'm just kind of a puddle over here. Um, and I urge you um, to get copies of Kathy and Victoria's books and to read more of Kayla's work. And so we have um, about like 10 minutes, we're gonna have, um, I'm gonna ask the readers to have a short discussion and response to these pieces. Uh, I'm just gonna throw out a prompt if that'll help um, to start us off and um, again, I think for many of us, the ongoing hate-based attacks on Asian Americans, particularly the massacre of Asian American women in Atlanta, has been weighing on all of our minds. Um, and Catherine's unpublished novel is called The Fetishist. And she basically charged head on to interrogate and disrupt those exoticizing and harmful stereotypes. So I, you know, I'd love to hear about your work in this context or how places like McDowell have offered you expansive and safe places to work out these complex and troubling issues into art or whatever else you want to talk about. Um, I can I can start. I um, McDowell. Some of my happiest memories have been in McDowell. My, just certainly my happiest memories as a writer. I think every writer can tell you is um, that you know the worst moments are writing, but also the happy mo happiest moments are when you're writing too, because that is when the writing is going well. And, you know, I would always be just, just stuck all the time. Sometimes, not all the time, but a lot of times in New York, but then magically when I went to McDowell, it would just flow, the right, just inspiration would just flow. And I think it was not just a time, but it was also just this, this, it was such a sanctuary. And, you know, I, you know, I think some writing institutions, writing institutions can be um, either as exclusive or homogenous and um, um, cold or impersonal or just, you know, racially a little weird, but uh, McDowell was never like that. I never felt that. I always felt at home. I always thought the staff was like family. And, um, you know, and I actually I do remember I've been to McDowell quite a few times. And um, I remember actually one of the times I went, I was pregnant and I was struggling to write poetry. And I was, I was said, screw it. I'm just going to write prose and I'm just going to just, you know, um, write um, just write out my frustrations. And I think I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have had the guts to make the transition to prose now that I think about it and, until I went to uh, McDowell and um, had the time to just really uh, do it, um, to write in a different medium. And then, um, and I, and the, and the last time I was at McDowell was uh, when I was finishing 
minor feelings. And it, I was just there for two weeks and it was so valuable. It was so important to me. I mean, I don't know if I would have finished any of my books if it weren't for Miguel. And I know it was probably, it was the same from Catherine and how happy she was at McDowell and um, even when we were at Yaddo together, she was always just going on about how, what an incredible open place McDowell was. And, um, and she was, I really hope that we, the public gets to see even just a portion of the fetishist because it seems to capture so much of her, her sensitivity and intellect, but also her subversiveness. You know, I forgot to mention that in the introduction was like how sly she was and funny. And that was her, it was her subversiveness that I also really connected to. And it was just that beautiful kind of, um, she had that beautiful tender heartedness and also that sort of renegade spirit that you really saw in her writing. You know, I, I, Kathy said so much, I don't know if I have much else to offer, um, but that my time at McDowell was really a wonderful time. I had never done a residency before. And I never really considered it. I always thought that I could write without one, you know, just also being really, really busy. But my, I think I had a, a bias against um, residencies and and then I went to McDowell with, you know, sort of maybe not the, the most positive attitude. And, uh, but when I got there, I, I wrote for two weeks straight. So <laughs> I think it's really valuable. I felt really comfortable there. And I met so many amazing writers. The community there, I think, is really important. It's hard to imagine over two weeks that you could become so close to people, but there really is nothing else to do there. It is in the middle of nowhere. So I met the poet, um, the wonderful poet Hua Wen and Tommy Orange was there when I was there, the fiction writer, and it was great. And, um, you know, we would spend time uh, just working and then socializing. I remember Hua invited me over to her place and read my, um, I don't know what they're called, the tarot, because, yeah, she did my a reading for me. And I never had anyone do that for me before. And so I think there is so much time to work, but also so much time to connect with people in ways that are really special. And it was nice to be there with other um, poets of color and also uh, fiction writers um, of color as well, BIPOC writers, and very diverse. And so I really, uh, I really appreciated that. So um, yeah, I think it's, I'm a fan now of, of these kinds of spaces. And since then, I've gone to do the Lannan residency in Marfa, Texas. So I'm I'm, I see the value of it now and how it really does open up um, crevices, you know, within your brain, where normally if, if you're not there, you fill those crevices, 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 um, crevices, I don't know, uh, with all kinds of junk, right? And so that is a very freeing space to be in. So I really, now I see it. I see why Catherine went so many times. I understand why it was her happy place. So I really, I, I appreciate uh, having had the opportunity to go. Yeah, and I can just say, you know, growing up, um, I, I was really little when mom first went to McDowell, so I kind of, and she went many times, so I kind of grew up hearing about it as this magical, legendary place where, where she got her best work done and made lifelong friends, and, um, and I think that, you know, all, all writers in all stages need that validation of, like, knowing that you're a writer and that other people see you as one and meeting other writers and um, all that comes out of that. So I think, and maybe especially as a, a writer of color, as a woman, um, you especially need that. So I know that mom got that um, from McDowell and, and that they took a chance on her pretty early in her career and, and it just opened up worlds for her. And um, she wrote a lot of her first novel there. I agree so much with everything everyone is saying. I also think one of the things about McDowell, it's also actually reflected into how wonderfully organized this event was. 
um, even though I had to ask Gina 12 times, where's the Zoom link, what time? Um, I think as artists, we don't see how much work goes into the organizing of it. Like the staff is so welcoming and organizing that so much is cleared away that we're just able to work. And then also McDowell seems to just let in super great, super talented, but really communal minded people. And um, I agree, it's really so, it's such an easy entry place. So you really can get to work right away rather than just, you know, spending a lot of time finding your footing or something. That is what is really, really special about McDowell. And um, one thing that Catherine and I shared, we would always get this post uh, depression, like post leaving depression. And my husband would always complain that I wouldn't unpack and I would just leave the stuff out. And I don't know, I just thought it would somehow unpack itself. But then once when um, I was over at Catherine's place, her partner apparently said, would say when her suitcase is open, like this makes me sad. And so my, I told that to my husband so he could say that too. And, but it was just, I think it really was, it's such a magical time that it just kind of makes life, I don't know, <laughs> it's so magical that you just want to be there all the time. And mm -hmm. that is one of my just such wonderful memories of even just the open suitcase with all your stuff. So, um, but so I, I want to thank um, all the readers for sharing with us today. This was just an incredible reading.